Thanks everybody for joining tonight. My name is Olivia. Um, I'm a fourth year medical student at the University of Rochester. We're going to be uh, talking about um, muscular dystrophies today, specifically Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And they seem to be having a little bit of technical difficulty for some reason. Let's see. But it'll let me share my screen. There we go. Oh. Hmm. Sorry, guys, this is being a little bit funky for me. Okay, there we go. So, like I said, sorry for the clearly techno not super te technologically savvy. Um, here nor there, my name's Olivia, fourth year medical student at the University of Rochester. Um, I went to undergrad at RIT. Um, I got my bachelor's in biomedical sciences from there. And then I also went on to do a master's of health and well-being management there. Um, and then, of course, again, I'm in medical school here, and I just applied to residency. So I'm in the process of those applications now. Um, so for those of you applying to medical school currently, I can totally relate to the stress of that process again. Um, there are some pictures of me um, in the hospital. I really enjoy uh, pediatrics, which is why I'm presenting to you about a pediatric topic today. Um, and yeah. So I've been with Motivate MD for a little bit over two years. I'm an editor, so some of you might have worked with me before. Um, I'm an advisor, I'm a peer coach, so I do a lot of different things with the um, company. So I'd like to do an icebreaker um, now. I've shared a lot of uh, little facts about myself and I'll share some more. And then uh, we're just gonna kind of go through the list of people here and if you can expand on what someone else said with a fact about yourself that might relate to the person before you, um, that would be great. Just gives us an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit. Um, so I'm a dog mom. You might have seen a picture of my dog on the other um, screen there. I, I love dogs and I love to walk my dog, hike with my dog and do all of the things. So I think the first person I see here is Brianna, Brianna, so I'm going to popcorn to you. Hi, um, I'm Brianna. I'm a first year pre-med student. Um, I'm doing cell and molecular biology. I go to Augusta University and I also have a dog. He's a chihuahua and his name is Shorty. So. Amazing. We love dogs here. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thank you for sharing, Brianna. Um, the next person I see is Drew. Hi, I'm Drew uh, from Oklahoma, a career changer here. So I am 39 right now. Uh, I also have a dog and I live in Oklahoma, so I like to bird hunt with that dog. Lovely. Okay, so we're a dog-loving group so far. It's really nice to meet you, Drew. Thank you for sharing. Um, the next person that I see is Reem, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi, um, I'm Reem. I'm still an undergrad student, and I'm not pre-med. I'm actually pre-PA, but I just like to join these little meetings and learn as much as I can. And I have a cat, not a dog. Okay, so we're changing up the flow a little bit. Wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. And welcome. We love all healthcare fields. It's all about collaboration. Um, the next person I see is Abigail. Hi, my name's Abby. I'm a second year in undergrad, and I'm also a cat person. I have three cats. Lovely. So two for cats. Okay. Nice to meet you. Um, the next person I see is Kenan, if I'm pronouncing it right. 
Yes, you are. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and thank you. Sorry, it's dark in here. So, um, so yeah, um, I'm Kenan. I am an animal lover. I do not. I don't have any dogs or cats because I'm allergic to them. But mm -hmm. when, whenever I'm out in the field outside, I do love little chihuahuas and and of course little kittens of course, of course. so and yes i'm a pre-med student as well and um i and yeah lovely it's so nice to meet you thank you for yeah, sharing you too. of course the last person i see is logan if you're here logan yeah hey everybody uh so i'm logan i'm a fourth year pre-med student i'm at the university of arkansas and i'm doing physics uh, and then I guess going along the pets theme, I got two cats. I love them very much. Wonderful. So we're definitely a pet animal loving group. Um, so no hot debates today. That's great. Um, wonderful. So we'll move on here. So for those of you who haven't joined us for virtual shadowing before, the way we do this is we'll go through a case about a patient. Um, we'll discuss their physical exam potential differential diagnoses for their presentation. We'll go through the assessment and plan, and then we'll talk a little bit more in detail about the pathology of the disease. And like I said, we're talking about Duchenne muscular dystrophy today. Um, so I love to talk. I love to get to know you guys. So actively participate, um, camera on, camera off. It's up to you, whatever you're comfortable with, but um, I love the participation. Um, and then also there is a SOAP note that you'll be filling out throughout the presentation and then you'll submit that at the end. And you'll also complete a quiz at the end that you should have gotten in an email. Um, so yeah, please fill that out. Here's a little QR code for anybody who might not have access to that um, SOAP note form. Okay, so if everybody's ready, we're just gonna go ahead and get started here uh, with our case details. So this is a five-year-old male is our patient today. He's brought in by, or bought, brought into his pediatrician by his parents and they report that he seems quote, weaker than he should. Um, they discussed that he's been struggling to go up and down the stairs of their two-story home. Uh, he previously was able to use the stairs without trouble until they think about four months ago or so, but they have trouble remembering exactly when. Um, but that was around the time that they started to know that he was having some trouble. He also just kind of seems clumsy to them and he falls over rather frequently. Um, they're not really sure if this is something they should be concerned about or if his development might just be delayed. Uh, so they brought him in to talk to you about that. Once we talk to them a little bit more, um, uh, we find out that he's able to grasp a pencil, um, but he stumbles a little bit when trying to catch a ball. He also can assist with getting himself dressed in the morning. He likes to do that with his parents. Um, he can count to 10, he's real smart, um, and he proudly shows us his ability to count to 10 in the office. And a little plug for pediatrics, working with the kids is always super, super fun. Okay. So do any details in the history obtained thus far stand out to you and why? Um, and feel free to just unmute and share um, your thoughts. And I can go back to the slide with the history if that's helpful. If it'll let me. Well, it might not. Yeah, it, oh, there we go. So any details here stand out to you? Some of them may be bolded. <laughs> um, I would say that he used to be able to use the stairs, but now he's having difficulties with it. That's the first thing that like, came up. Yeah, yeah, good, great. So, um, someone shared, I can't see names right now. I'm kind of like balancing between looking at that and looking at the slides here, but um, someone noted that he used to be able to go up to the stairs and now he can't. Um, so that's kind of weird. That stands out. Good. Anything else? Oh, 
All right, we'll move on. Why do you think the pediatrician might have asked about this patient's ability to count to 10 or throw a ball? You know, they came in worried about what? So why do we think that they might be asking these questions? Any thoughts? Also, don't be scared to be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. So any opinions are welcome. The parents were worried about him being behind pace, like mentally. Mm. Mm, okay, right. So um, there were some concerns about maybe developmental delay, right? Like, is this something to be concerned about? Is it just developmental delay? Is it not that big of a deal? Um, good. All right. So this is a little bit overwhelming to look at. Um, and, you know, if you're going into medicine, which obviously all of you seem to plan to do, um, this is something you'll see over and over and over again. And you still probably won't remember it all. And that's okay. Um, but essentially, children have these milestones. Um, there's various categories, and one of them that we look for are gross motor milestones or like major motor milestones. Um, in that first year of life, you'll notice here, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. I hope you can. Um, but here, we really look at milestones pretty frequently, right? Like this first one, we have zero to two months, three to four months six to eight months, and then all of a sudden we start to jump like by year. So that's something to note here. But specifically, it says by 13 to 14 months, a child should be able to walk alone pretty well. There's usually some sort of leeway in here, right? Every kid's a little bit different. It doesn't have to be a hard and fast rule. Um, but generally, that's when we look for a kid to be able to walk on their own. By two years, they should be able to walk up and down the stairs alone. So initially, you know, 15 to 18 months, they might start to walk up the stairs. They still have to crawl a little bit to get down the stairs. But by two years, they should be able to do that pretty well. And then by four years, they should be able to catch a ball pretty reliably without stumbling, without having any problems. So if we think about that in relation to our patient's presentation, um, he was five years old, right? And what are the things that he was struggling with, if anybody can share? Uh, he was struggling with using the stairs, um, catching a ball. Yeah, those two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. So he was having a little bit of trouble going up and down the stairs. Um, and it seemed like he wasn't able to really catch a ball very well. So is that normal for a five-year-old? Not so normal for a five-year-old? Not so normal, right? So what do we think so far? Do we think this could just be developmental delay? I mean, I know that you guys know what the case is, but but what might give you an indication that it could be developmental delay or not? He started out being able to go up the stairs and then it started to decline or get worse. Yeah, perfect. That's a huge point. And, and that's a really key thing to look at when you're assessing a patient, right, is kind of that timeline. Have they ever been able to do it? Um, and then they couldn't anymore? Were they never able to do it? Awesome. Okay, so like I said, there's other milestones too. Um, those are just the gross motor milestones, um, but we have other ones like fine motor, um, social, sensory, speech, language, and all of them have different expectations at those various months in the first year of life, and then, you know, two years, three years, and so on. Um, so we talked a little bit about how the pediatrician asked, you know, is he able to um, dress himself? Um, that uses some fine motor skills, for example, being able to do up buttons, and um, that's more of a fine motor skill. 
Um, the same thing with being able to grab, grasp a pencil. If you remember, he was able to grasp a pencil pretty well. Um, and that little pincher grasp um, and the way that we expect a child to be able to hold a pencil eventually um, is something they should learn pretty early on. Um, here in the picture is just a CDC's, um, this is like a flyer essentially, and you can actually print these out on the CDC's website and provide them to parents or recommend that parents look at these online. Um, and it can give parents like a general idea of what to expect for their child at various ages. All right, so revisiting the case, just for anybody who might've forgotten, um, we've got a five-year-old, he's weaker than he should be, having trouble going up and down the stairs, and that's new for him. Seems a little bit clumsy, but he's able to grasp a pencil, he's able to count to 10, he can get dressed in the morning or help with that, um, but he does stumble a little bit when he tries to catch a ball. Is there anything else outside of what we talked about so far that you would want to know about this kid if he came into your office? I would say family history of anything. Yeah, family history is huge, good. Um, so when we're interviewing a patient, um, history is a big, a big thing. So family history, um, what other types of history could we take? Um, if he has a past medical history or if he takes any other medications. Yeah, awesome, awesome. So any past medical history, any medications, good stuff. Um, all really important things to ask because they can put things into context, right? What could this be related to? Um, so we have past medical history, family history, medications, one really nice thing with pediatrics is oftentimes, um, unless they're super medically complex, there's not really much medical history to, to speak of um, or medications besides the occasional allergy med or something like that. Um, but oftentimes um, they're pretty healthy, thankfully. Good, is there anything else that you wanna know? Mm, you can ask if the child has fallen or gotten injured recently. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Um, so has this child fallen? Is there any injury that could explain his symptoms, right? Are we going to go down a rabbit hole of thinking something super severe? Or could it be that he hurt himself because five-year-olds are supposed to be able to run up and down the stairs and play and do all the things? Good. Anything else? You guys are doing awesome. Good. Other things that you might think about would be like, is there any history of recent illness, like infection? Um, that's something else that I would probably ask. Um, but you guys are hitting all of the major points. All right, so let's talk about his physical exam. Super important always, uh, and a neuro exam is, is extra important. Um, so we have our general appearance here. He is well nourished, appropriately attentive to the examiner and shows age appropriate social skills. So seems pretty normal so far. This is cardiovascular and respiratory. So we've got a regular rate and rhythm, symmetrical chest rise. So that means um, both sides of the chest are rising equally with ev every breath. And just to note here, you'll notice that um, Outside of the neurological exam, this physical exam is pretty limited. Um, and that's because in neurology, we often do um, a really targeted exam, a neuro exam. Um, granted, this kid is at his pediatrician's, but that's just something to consider how different specialties attack um, exams differently based on what they do and what they're looking for. So we have our neuro exam. This toddler is awake, he's alert, he's playing on the floor. His speech is clear. He can speak in complete sentences, so that's good. We look at his pupils. They're equal, round, and reactive to light. So we put a, a light in his pupils, and we see that they constrict to light on both sides. That's good. Extraocular movements are intact. That means that he can move his eyes all around, and there's nothing funky going on there. Um, and there's no obvious vis visual field deficit, so that means that it doesn't seem like he can't see in any certain spot of his visual field. 
his facial expressions appear symmetrical. So when he smiles, when he frowns, when he makes, makes various expressions, there doesn't seem to be any sort of asymmetry in that. And all similarly, his tongue movements are normal and symmetrical. SCM strength appears normal. SCM is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. It kind of comes up here and it allows you to look up and back that way. Um, so that looks fine. His hearing seems good. Sensation seems good. Everything's looking pretty good so far. Um, is there anything we haven't examined yet? or for uh, in other words, what sort of things would you really wanna make sure you examine super closely in this kiddo? Something that can be helpful is thinking about the reason that he initially came in. So why is he here? Any ideas? So he's having trouble going up, up and down the stairs. Oh, is somebody gonna say something? I was just gonna say his muscles. Yeah, and great, great. Enough. Muscles and bones, okay, good. So, you know, he's having trouble going up and down the stairs. So let's see, you know, what his strength looks like and movement, good, awesome. So his muscle tone appears normal. Muscle tone essentially um, is when you look at somebody and does it seem like, um, or muscle tone rather is when you examine a child and um, they might seem like they have really low tone. So if you think about, I'm gonna use a baby as an example. If I were to hold up a baby and they were to be super, super, super floppy and not really move much, that would be really low tone. Um, versus if I picked up a baby and their um, legs were super, super stiff and straight, that would be high tone. Um, think about it almost like if your muscles were in a constant state of um, flexion or relaxation, super, super relaxed. That's kind of a basic way to look at that. Um, so muscle tone appears normal, um, but there's slightly decreased bulk in the bilateral lower extremities. Um, bulk is when you look at the muscle, right? How big is it? Does it seem like a normal size? Does it seem too small? Does it seem really big? Um, he's walking independently, but he's waddling a little bit when he walks. So that's kind of funky. He's a little bit unsteady. He often trips over his feet. Um, and when he tries to stand up from the ground, when he's sitting on the ground, he uses his hands for support. And that's something that we call the Gower sign. When we do test his formal strength, um, we see pretty good strength in his upper extremities. So looking at his shoulders, his biceps, his triceps, um, even you can look at wrists and things. Um, however, when we get to the lower extremities, his hips and his knees, they seem a little bit weaker than they should be. And you'll see numbers down there like four out of five, three out of five. Um, so not a full five out of five strength. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We also check his reflexes. It's a big thing in neurology, right? Is the reflex hammer. And in the bilateral lower extremities and in both knees, um, they're one plus. And in the upper extremities, they're two plus. Is that normal or abnormal? Does anybody know with the, the reflexes? Where you could take a, an educated guess. We'll talk a little bit about it here in a second. So when he tries to stand up in the office, you notice this. Hopefully it'll play. So that's how he stands up. I'll play it one more time. Kind of interesting, right? Oops. 
let's see if, well, is it going to let me go past it? There we go. Okay. So like I said, we checked his muscles, we checked his reflexes, and uh, there's all those numbers when we, when we look at those things. And that's because we have a grading system so that we have some semi-objective way of measuring these things. So in his lower extremities, he had some three and some four muscle power gratings. So this is when there is active movement against gravity, number three. And number four is active movement against gravity and moderate resistance. And this can be a, kind of a hard thing to wrap your head around. Um, but if you look at the whole scale, zero is no contraction. So they have no strength at all, right? It's just kind of a limp, um, let's say arm. Um, number one, uh, or muscle power grading one, is there's like a trace of a contraction. So you're not even trying to push against their muscles or have them move with you, but you can see that their muscles are twitching a little bit um, just by looking. Um, in number two, um, active movement with gravity eliminated. They're able to do that, but when there is gravity, they can't do that. So a good way to think about this is that if I have my arm up here um, and I were to hold the patient's arm, and I'm kind of eliminating gravity in a sense from them. Um, I'm supporting their arm essentially, and they can move their arm like this. That would be uh, number two. Number three, active movement against gravity would be, um, I can kind of move my arm on my own. Number four would be um, doing this with someone pushing a little bit against me and um, but, but struggling, not full strength. And then number five would be able to provide total resistance to someone pushing against my arm without a problem. Again, a little hard to wrap your mind around, but the more that you practice it, um, the more that you become familiar with it. And then similarly with uh, reflex grading, we check reflexes all over the body. Um, you can check um, lower extremities, upper extremities, and there's multiple spots within those to check. Um, and he had two plus responses and one plus responses. So two plus is normal. So if you think of like the doctor hitting your knee at the doctor's office and your knee kicks out, that's a pretty normal response if you have normal reflexes. Um, one plus would be you have a slight little twitch, but it's a little bit weak. So we obviously at this point know that his physical exam is not normal. So we want to do a little bit more investigation. So we look at some labs. We look at a CMP. This is a sodium level, 140, that's normal. Potassium, chloride, and we'll just keep going from there. Okay, so we have his CMP results. All of this is normal. Um, and if you have like something to reference at some point when you're kind of learning what's normal and abnormal, which is something you won't have to know for a long time, um, you start to get familiar with what's generally kind of average. But this is, this is a pretty normal CMP. Then we get a CBC. So this is looking at the complete blood count. So what do his white blood cells look like, red blood cells, things like that. And this is also normal. Seems pretty, pretty good so far. Could you think of anything that might potentially be abnormal in his labs? And this is a, this is a really tough question and I don't expect you to know, but you could try to guess. So here we have a creatine kinase, um, or shorthand CK, is 25,000, or 25,000, 2,500. <laughs> um, and just to put this into perspective for you, um, normal is like 25 to 30. So this is super not normal. And we'll talk more about how this relates to all of the 
um, pathology shortly. Okay, so normal CMP, his electrolytes look good, his blood count looks good, but he has this wonky CK reading. So at this point, we know that there's something going on with him, right? He has an abnormal physical exam and he has abnormal labs. And all of you fine neurologists realize that this requires a little bit of further digging. So we got to think about it. A good way to think about differential diagnoses in neurology is to put them into buckets. And the more that you get familiar with um, medicine and kind of organizing yourself, you will probably hear something along these lines a lot um, in various specialties. Um, buckets are huge. And it really helps you organize um, different trains of thought or modes of thinking. So for neurology, we're gonna think of the different levels of the neuro, uh, nervous system that could be affected, right? There's lots of different portions of the nervous system and it can get a little bit overwhelming, um, but we'll keep it relatively simple. First, uh, we'll start at like the very top, um, which uh, unfortunately I guess is at the bottom of this um, table. But um, so the brain, right? the cerebrum and the various different parts of the brain, the brain stem, the cerebellum, that's a pretty obvious part of our nervous system. So if something were to be going wrong there, um, what could it be? So hypotonic cerebral palsy is one of those things. Um, you may have, may or may not have heard of cerebral palsy before. Does anybody know what cerebral palsy is? Or if you don't know what it is, have you heard of it? Actually, I do know a lot about cerebral palsy. I can, and I can definitely tell you. Yeah, give me a fact. What is cerebral palsy? Sure. So cerebral palsy is, is a type of muscular um, disease that, um, that deals involved with the muscles. Like, let's say, like, Let's say like it, it involves with the hands, the um, and of course the legs, like not enough movement within the, the muscles. And it's a mm. think of it as like a delay in, in those muscles. That's what I like to think of as CP because I know a lot of friends who have CP and some of them are like in a wheelchair and can't even walk because of the, the delay in those muscles that help them coordinate with eyes, the movement, everything. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, good, excellent. Um, you're totally on the right track there. Yeah, cerebral palsy definitely affects our muscles, which is why we have it on this differential diagnosis list, right? Um, so cerebral palsy is um, damage to the brain, essentially, that happens around birth. And then it has downstream effects that can affect our muscles. And we'll, we won't go any further into it than that um, for, the, for the sake of time. But awesome, good job. So the next level we could look at is the spinal cord, right? If something's not going on in the brain, something could also be going on in the spinal cord. So what could be going on there? Um, spinal muscular atrophy is another diagnosis that can kind of cause similar symptoms in terms of like muscular weakness. And that occurs as an issue at the level of the spinal cord versus an issue at the level of the brain. So that's an option. We also have just our, our nerves, right? Our peripheral nerves. So we have brain, spinal cord, and then a bunch of nerves coming out of our spinal cord that supply our muscles and our skin and allow us to move and feel things and all of that stuff. So things can go wrong with those nerves themselves. Things include multiple sclerosis, which is a more common one that people have, tend to hear of. Um, and then another one is Guillain-Barre syndrome, um, which is a post-viral syndrome that affects the peripheral nerves. Um, another one is the neuromuscular junction. So for those of you who are pre-meds, you probably know what the neuromuscular junction is. Can anybody tell me what that is?
Is it a type of region around the spinal cord area? You're close. So it's definitely kind of an area, right? It's where the nerves, so the nerves coming out of our spinal cord meet the muscles. And that's how we get the signals to our muscles to make them contract and move. Um, so issues can go wrong kind of right at that connection point. Um, and myasthenic syndrome. So this would include like myasthenia gravis, which um, is another one that people tend to have heard of before. There's usually a lot of commercials about like myasthenia gravis and multiple sclerosis. So, um, but that's what happens um, in myasthenia gravis is there's an issue with that connection. And then finally, we have the level of the muscle themselves. So things can go wrong in the muscle itself that causes issues. And that's where we get Duchenne's, um, Becker, and other muscular dystrophies. So, um, to synthesize everything that we've talked about so far and make sense of it, we know we have a five-year-old patient. He's a male. Um, he's met all of his developmental milestones appropriately, but in the last four months, he's had this progressive bilateral, which means on both sides, lower extremity weakness. So weakness of the legs on both sides. His physical exam is concerning for pelvic girdle weakness. So if you remember, his hip flexors were kind of weak. They didn't have full strength. Hip flexors would be what allows you to move your, um, like let's say you were sitting and you pulled your knees up words towards the sky, that's hip flexors. Um, so he's got pelvic girdle weakness, diminished lower extremity reflexes, a positive Gower sign, which was when the, he was sitting and he had to kind of use his upper body to help him stand up because his lower body is so weak. Um, and his lab showed an elevated uh, CK level of 2,500. So we know he's got this progressive muscle weakness, um, and he's young. His overall clinical picture is most concerning for a progressive muscular dystrophy, right? And somebody mentioned earlier that he previously was able to do things and now he can't. Um, so it's progressively getting worse, particularly Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and we'll talk more about that. So we'll plan to work this up further. We obviously have these concerns that it could be this, but we want to confirm so we'll do some genetic analysis to confirm the diagnosis. If we need to, we could consider a muscle biopsy to look at the actual muscle itself. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. So Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's a progressive genetic muscular dystrophy. And muscular dystrophy just means a weakening and wasting of the muscles. Uh, so we talked a little bit about muscle um, bulk in the physical exam, and it said that he had some decreased muscle bulk, um, and that's secondary to this, right? They're kind of wasting away almost. This happens due to uh, damage to a specific gene called the dystrophin gene, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that all works in a minute. But damage to this particular gene is what results in this phenotype. Um, and if you know what a phenotype is, that's just like kind of his outward presentation and these symptoms that we can visualize. It's inherited in an X-linked recessive fashion, um, which some of you might know how that works based on some of your studies in undergrad. But essentially, this means that males are pretty much always the ones that are affected. Um, so we have the X, Y, and Y chromosomes um, that has to do with genetic sex, biological sex. Um, and this particular gene is on that X chromosome. But we didn't have any family history reported. You know, they didn't say anything about family history. So what the heck? Do we think he actually has Duchenne? Can anybody talk to me a little bit about what could be going on there? Uh, if his mother is heterozygous for the, the dystrophy in the recessive gene, then she wouldn't present with anything. And then 
his dad would just pass along the Y gene. So that wouldn't really matter. Yeah, a hundred percent. Awesome job. So yeah, so mom could be a carrier or would be a carrier in this point for sure. Um, and females tend not to be affected. Now there are instances where carriers, female carriers have presenting symptoms. It's relatively rare. It can happen um, and it's it's rare, but good. Um, and another thing is spontaneous mutations can occur. Um, so sometimes um, a mutation might occur and it just happens to be a mistress Rofen gene. And so we get this presentation without any family history. Um, but just like you said, um, it would have been passed down in the females on his maternal side uh, for a while. And so it could have been a while since there was a male that actually was presenting um, with Duchenne. Or even if it was just a couple of generations ago, um, it's very well maybe that a grandfather or a great grandfather had passed away secondary to Duchenne before any official diagnosis was made. So it just might be that the family history is unknown. And then can anybody tell me what this picture down here is of? What is that called? So this is our Gower sign when they're using their um, upper body to help them stand up. Age of onset for Duchenne is generally between two and five years. Um, I hate to use the word onset because it's really more like um, diagnosis is between two and five years. Um, that's when we start to really see the symptoms, they get noticed and then they're brought into the doctors and they, they get diagnosed. Um, so just like somebody said, X-linked recessive um, genetic defect. So um, sons or male um, infants are affected. And this visualizes exactly um, what you said beautifully. So like I said, I was going to tell you a little bit more about that dystrophin gene. So it codes for a protein that anchors the cytoskeleton of skeletal and actually cardiac muscles as well to the extracellular matrix. And there are some GIFs that I am not skilled enough to make, but they came from this YouTube video down here um, that illustrate this process a little bit. Um, so mutations in this protein obviously lead to altered dystrophin structure. So that protein no longer functions correctly. Um, and this actually ends up leading to a disruption in that um, like cell wall. Um, or cell cyt the cytoskeleton, which leads to necrosis of uh, affected muscles and eventually replacement of that muscle tissue with connective tissue and fatty tissue. Um, so it's just really a non-functional muscle at all. Of note, the dystrophin gene is the largest known protein coding gene in the human um, DNA. So this means that it's at an increased risk for spontaneous mutations. Just because it's so big, um, it's pretty easy or likely for something to happen to it. So clinical features, we talked a little bit about some of these. Um, this is kind of like that waddling gait that I mentioned. Um, and then this is another uh, Gower sign that you can see happening here. Um, and this waddling gait happens just because of that pelvic girdle weakness. So the weakness of their um, hips um, makes it so that they just can't really support themselves very well. Um, we also have that progressive muscle paresis and atrophy. So weakness, atrophy, or wasting of the muscles. And this starts in a proximal lower limb. So like I've been saying, that pelvic girdle, and then it extends to the upper extremities as the disease progresses. So again, this is a progressive muscular dystrophy. So once symptoms start, they just kind of keep getting worse. We have the weak reflexes, which we saw in our patient. We already talked about these. Calf pseudohypertrophy is when because of that muscle necrosis and the replacement with connective and fatty tissue, um, it might look like the calf muscles are large, um, so hypertrophic or hypertrophied, 
um, but it's pseudo. So, so it's not actually hypertrophied. It's not actually larger muscles. It's replacement of those muscles with fatty tissue. Scoliosis is another thing that we'll see a lot. Um, and that's because the weakness of the lower um, extremities um, leads to like instability and lack of support of the um, like lumbar spine and things like that. And that leads to like misalignment of the vertebrae eventually. And really this is so progressive and it's pretty devastating. And kids usually can't walk by about 12 years of age. They can't walk at all. Um, as I mentioned before, this particular gene is also involved with cardiac and respiratory muscles. So you actually can see issues um, as a result of that as well. One of these is dilated cardiomyopathy, which essentially just um, leads to heart failure. Different cardiac arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms and respiratory insufficiency. So if you think about your diaphragm, excuse me, your diaphragm is a muscle. And if your diaphragm is not working properly, um, which helps you breathe in and out um, by expanding and kind of contracting that rib cage, you're gonna have a hard time breathing. So as we talked about um, diagnosis, we do blood testing. We use an increased serum cre creatine kinase. Um, and that's basically a breakdown product. Um, it's a result of that muscle death, essentially. And then we also do a genetic analysis because this is typically um, genetic um, and we'll see abnormalities in that dystrophin gene when we do that. If all of that is inconclusive, then um, our, our last resort would be doing a muscle biopsy, um, which there's a photo of that here um, to, to look at the muscle itself. And this is sort of illustrating, you know, this is a normal muscle, I want to say fascicle. It's been a while since I've done, had to know those specific terms, but um, this is a muscle, normal muscle. And then here you notice that all of that muscular tissue is kind of atrophied away and it's starting to be replaced by this orange stuff here, it's stained orange, um, which is like fibrotic tissue and eventually it'll be fat. Um, and that's essentially what I just said there. So management, um, we can do pharmacotherapy um, or medication. So glucocorticoids, which is just steroids, what that means, can help, de help decrease inflammation. That can help slow and delay progression. Um, and then there's also genetic therapies that actually help to alter the process of DNA um, replication, um, transcription, and translation so that um, we end up with a at least somewhat functional dystrophin gene or pr protein rather, um, essentially skips over the exon, helps skip over the exons that might otherwise be removed and result in a damaged um, protein. Something else that's really important is supportive care. So physiotherapy, essentially like PT exercises to help preserve or maintain whatever strength can be maintained as long as possible. Assistive devices, so crutches, walker, wheelchair, orthotics to help support joints. Proper nutrition, always good to do. And then psychological support for the patient and also often family. It's not an easy thing to go through as you can imagine. Um, also important is assessment of respiratory and cardiac function, like we talked about. So we can do pulmonary function testing, which is seeing, you know, how well um, lungs expand and how much, um, how, how well they're breathing, essentially. And uh, some patients may end up needing a tracheostomy or a breathing tube through their um, neck. And this is just kind of permanent respiratory support. Um, we also might use an EKG or an MRI to evaluate cardiac function. And other considerations might be medications to help manage heart failure if it's at that point. And immunizations are important too, um, trying to avoid any sort of infection or anything like that that will make an already sick child otherwise sicker, for lack of better words.